we think it's really weird that, you know, he had so many fan. I mean, he's a journalist and a writer. He's written like two fiction books. Why they want to see his dick so badly. Like, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like as if it's like a celebrity's dick. Hello, and welcome to Freelance Pod. My name's Sachandrika, and I'll be your host. So yes, that is quite an episode title, isn't it? And um, I am really excited to welcome Mail Magazine's Deputy Editor, Alana Levinson, onto the podcast this episode, and we do dive into the great solicited dick experiment, um, which Alana describes from uh, the origin of the idea, which came from her colleague, Miles Clee, through to how they went about it, how she edited it, and what it taught her about how men and women experience the internet very differently and uh, how the internet treats us very differently. If you don't know Mail Magazine, it's a publication that's online only and it's for the male reader, although obviously anyone can read it. And uh, Alana does talk about what she's looking for in terms of pitches and freelancers later on in the podcast. And uh, yeah, they're looking for sort of male perspectives on a variety of things. That can include culture, health, internet etiquette, dating, you name it. We also talk about quorum culture, which is a, a nice name for all the cultural developments that occurred on the internet over lockdown. And yeah, what editing adds to the process of writing online. So obviously back in the analogue era, editing was an inextricable part of getting published. There was no way your stuff was getting out there without going past at least one set of editor's eyes. But now in the internet age, obviously we can press publish on any number of platforms at any time. We can think that editing is dispensable and it's certainly invisible. So Alana talks about why you know, best editing is collaborative and how she goes about it. So uh, yeah, let's just dive straight in and hear from Alana Levinson, Deputy Editor of Mail Magazine. You know, Mel is a culture magazine. We love investigating subcultures, um, what's happening on the internet. And so when originally when the global pandemic sort of started, we were a little bit out of, I think we were originally like, uh, you know, we're not a news site. How do we cover this? But I think what very quickly became apparent is, A, people are online all day and they're, they have so much more time. Um, or different relationships to their time to pick up hobbies like breaking, uh, baking bread is a big one. Um, people learning to cut their own hair, people navigating, going on, you know, walking dates, which we wrote about, which is where like people will meet on online dating and then they'll meet up with the masks and stay six feet apart and like go for a walk around the block or a hike. Um, so I think we've seen a lot of actually really interesting cultural developments that have come up from all of this and also definitely a return to domesticity. I've seen a lot of women um, tweeting and online and I've definitely felt this way of like, I've sort of resisted that um, my whole life. I think in terms of just like where I was at with feminism, I never really got super into it. And now I'm just like, I would love to cook a meal all day. <laughs> I think another thing we're seeing is a lot of people putting their foot in their mouth or going quarren crazy. Something that's been interesting about celebrity is like the press is no longer the gatekeeper to accessing information about them. Um, and in many ways, I mean, they might argue they have less control over their image. I think because, you know, anything can happen. The internet can say whatever they want and take them down quote unquote in a second. But on the other hand, they have way more control. Um, or they have way, yeah, they have way more control over how they're viewed because they're they're able to actually just get on Twitter and craft whatever image and get on Instagram and do, you know, there's more opportunities for them. I mean, I think we're also seeing that across, you know, it's most obvious with celebrities, but think about the way like a politician's tweet. The news story is now Joe Biden tweeted X. Um, or before he used to have to go to the, through the press to get whatever thing he was trying to say out there. I mean, I think politics and sports actually are very similar um, in terms of, especially when it comes to election coverage. There's so many high points. This has just been the greatest job of my career. Um, and I think, you know, something I'm really proud of is sort of the more feminist coverage that we've sort of paved the way for in men's publishing. You know, we started covering the Me Too movement 
very early on in like constructive ways, trying to help men see the ways that they were harming women and give them advice on as to how to stop that. Um, we did tons of pieces like that about like toxic masculinity and like trying to be constructive. Um, you know, more recently we, you know, I worked across all the deaths at Mel to do a guide for men on how to support your partner and yourself through an abortion. It was a guide for, um, pro-choice men. And we talked to men all across the country about their feelings about their, um, partner's abortions and like what, you know, how they let them down, what they wish they had done differently. And it's like one of the only guides that exists if you Google this um, on this topic, which is kind of surprising. You would think that given how how common this is of an experience, this is that there would be more. So, uh, you know, I'm really most proud, I think, of stuff like that, um, where I've kind of been able to um, you know, I, I used to write, I was a feminist writer and I wrote about two other women, how men are shitty was sort of like preaching to the choir. And this job has been really valuable in that now I'm speaking to men directly. So I have to find a way to like frame it in a way that's palatable, but also there is a hope that it might actually change someone. And that's been really gratifying. We're doing a big nostalgia package on the early aughts. Um, so typically every summer, you know, there's a big summer entertainment package that like news organizations will do about the big summer movies. Obviously that's not really happening right now. So we had this idea to sort of look back at um, the early aughts, which is a really interesting time for pop culture, particularly for millennials. And, you know, one of our first pieces we had um, our writer, Miles Clee, who's just really great writing about the internet and our culture more broadly. He did a piece about Frankie Muniz, who was, um, the star of Malcolm in the Middle. And that was, you remember him? Well, he basically ended up like just, that was the only thing he ever did. He made millions and millions of dollars. And then he became like a race car driver. Uh, he had all these health problems. Um, so he can't even really, re- he says he can't really remember being in Malcolm in the Middle because of his brain issues. Um, and now he owns like an olive oil company. And it's sort of about how he represents millennials um, more broadly. And today, Frankie tweeted it out saying it was the best thing ever written about him, which is interesting because the piece talks about how like sad he is. (laughs) Um, But the piece is all about how we're really confused by Frankie's um, Twitter presence because it's like it's so he's he, he will just like tweet the word pain like he's not trying to push some romantic version of himself the way other celebrities are like it's very much just like what he's thinking and feeling at any moment and people are really obsessed with that because it's very refreshing um it's very refreshing to see a celebrity like you know is talking about how bad they feel that they're that like oh it's the emmys i remember when i won one and then like never accomplished anything again um so i think like that really resonates with human with with you know regular people that are used to seeing celebs like never show that kind of vulnerability. And if they do, it's always like a means to an end, like they're doing it to still for their brand. And he, he doesn't care. He's like not in media anymore. Right. I remember the distinct switch. I remember getting the first computer in our house and having dial up AOL and trying to go online. My mom screaming at me to get off because she had to call her friend and you couldn't use both at the same time. Like I have very vivid memories of my first time using the internet. And I, cause I must've been what, 10, 11, 12. And I have seen the cultural change. So I think people that are my age, maybe a little bit older, they're very nostalgic people because we were, we can still remember a time period in which, um, things moved a lot slower. Um, but we also are of the internet because that happened when we were coming of age. So I think, um, that puts us in kind of an interesting position culturally. I mean, I wanted to be a journalist since I was 16. Um, and I was at the age where when I started interning, I guess when would that, when would that have been like, 2009, my first internship was at The Nation. I was a web intern and I I specifically applied to be the web intern because at that time it was easier to get a web internship. It was less prestigious, which is funny um, now because, you know, and when we got there, they didn't have a Facebook page. They didn't have a Twitter. We helped them set that up. Like I actually remember a time period where Facebook wasn't like driving a news strategy. It didn't, you know, and I mean, of course the Nation is um, a, a like, 
you know, sort of lefty print publication. So it's probably a little bit behind, but that's, that's insane to me. Like I, I similarly had no idea what was to come. I also didn't really understand the journalist as the public figure. Um, you know, I think even more so than just like kind of the trauma of having to be online and being like so much of, especially if you're, um, a woman, a person of color and a journalist, like how much harassment you end up getting. I had no idea about that. Um, I had no idea about the men, probably the mental health toll of being online all the time. Um, and lastly of just like this pressure to be a brand and to be a public figure in addition to being a journalist is, is interesting to me. I don't think I fully saw that either. And, you know, there are some people that just want to do journalism and don't really have any interest in, you know, their personal lives being, (laughs) being dragged up and all that stuff. And I know that's a specific kind of journalist, but I do think now that like, there is no, we are public figures who cover public figures. And that's, that's brings on a new set of challenges. And I totally agree. I mean, I was laid off twice before I was like 28 and I worked for like successful places. Like I also didn't really understand how unstable it was. Um, so sorry. Yeah, this is kind of a bummer, but I think that the reality of what it's like, I mean, I really thought I was reading about like Clay Felker, um, you know, the famous New York magazine editor and like what their lifestyles were like. And I did think it, okay, it's not the same as it was. And there are a lot of great things about that because, you know, like there's a lot more representation in different kinds of people in media now that there weren't before, but also like, um, it actually seemed like you could have like a middle class to even upper middle class. If you were at like Condé Nast, uh, (laughs) lifestyle and like, you know, like they didn't have to work every day of the week and all that stuff. So it's changed immensely. So I'm obsessed with like, but I think back in the day, I might be wrong about this, but deputy, which is technically the level I'm at, you got a car that like drove you around, which is, I mean, on the other hand, this is why the industry, like, it's like reprehensible that they were doing that. Like they were not running a lean business and that's why media is where we're at. Like, why would an editor need a town car? I don't even understand that. But it's like, the difference between that and then people who came up with me where we were writing blogs about like our deepest traumas on the internet for $50 and like making companies millions in ad revenue is like harrowing, you know, cause I very much came up in journalism at the time of the like personal essay. And a lot of women were writing online and we were all writing about ourselves without like any really, perspective on the impact that would have on the industry and also our own personal lives. Um, so it just seems so divorced from like, even, even people who were editors in like the early two thousands. There's an inflation and rightly so with, you know, having a platform and that would be writing in the times or, you know, writing to hundreds of thousands of followers as a journalist Um, that's having a large platform. And with that comes, um, you know, a sense of power and you have a lot of people that will listen to you. Um, and I think that rightfully, like I do, you know, on the other end, there are journalists that we see, um, particularly like on the right, but also on the left who like literally believe they are being silenced Um, they'll, they'll have insane platforms and they'll have columns in the New York times and they'll be like, I'm being silenced by the mob, you know, which I always think is interesting because every single journalist working today have seen probably an insane amount of harassment and like, like probably even worse than a lot of those people. (laughs) Um, but I've never seen that as me being silenced. You know what I'm saying? Like, I still think I have a big platform that I'm lucky to have. And that's part of what comes with it. Now, do I think it's taken too far? Absolutely. Um, Do I think it's fair that as journalists, like, you know, I get to be told that like someone wants to put my head in a jar? I don't. So it's, I think it's sort of complicated. Oh, now people feel comfortable telling me they don't like what I say you're not silenced. You're still allowed to say whatever you want. And it's unfortunate that now you have to actually be aware of how it impacts other people and they can tell you they don't like it, you know? Um, and 
that's, that's, you know, in some ways like been a great thing. Like I, I remember when the main way to get feedback as a journalist was like a letter to the editor and you wouldn't even see most of those. The interns are opening them. I definitely credit like social media and my Twitter to my career in general. Like that's what got the attention of a lot of editors that ended up hiring for me for my writing. Um, so I've always, I mean, it's like actually a really, I'm doing the artist way right now and I'm reevaluating my relationship with it because in some ways I feel like I'm nothing without it. Like I'm not good enough to be one of those writers that doesn't have to be on Twitter commenting and doing all that stuff. Um, and in some ways I'm super indebted to it because it got me visibility that like I wouldn't have had otherwise. But on the other hand, I feel that it's like a very toxic space that I would like to not engage in all the time. And finding that balance has been really difficult. Um, you know, I remember I, when I became, I used to be a staff writer and then I became an editor. So I stopped writing as much, but I would still tweet and have viral tweets from time to time. And like people that I would meet would just be like, I love your tweets. And it would always like make me sad. Cause I would be like, what about like the writing though, or like the actual work I do, like my tweets aren't my actual work, but, um, I think that they also kind of are. <laughs> What's interesting is like, I, yeah, I do tie a lot of my worth to writing, but I also always saw myself as an editor. And I think the career track editor is something that no longer really exists. I'm probably the last generation of it even happening. Like there used to be a time in journalism where like people wanted to be editors specifically not necessarily writers. It wasn't like you just write for a long time, then you become an editor. It was a specific skill. And I still think it's a specific skill that's very different from writing. Although all editors should write so that they understand what it's like. Um, but so for me, like I feel most comfortable editing and I get that same satisfaction from helping other people, um, really kill it on a piece. But I do also feel that where I'm like, I spend all day making other people better. Um, and I wonder what would have, what would have happened if I decided to actually just to, to, to do that myself. But I wasn't, I think I'm, my temperament again is just more fit to be an editor. I really dislike writing actually. It's very painful to me. I wasn't, I, I could do like, I needed a lot of time. I wasn't fast. Um, I just wasn't confident in it the way that I am about editing and that I think you need to be a writer, especially now, like you have to really like believe that what you have to say is important and that people need to hear it. <laughs> I do not think we know the long-term impact of doing this kind of work online, what that is yet to us. Um, I think it's beyond exhausting. I think it's very bad for our mental health. Um, and I know that's like a weird conversation to have as journalists, like in, in a lot of ways, we like see our industry as apart from others, like we'll be rallying for better treatment of people in other industries, but like never look at, you know, the, the impact that, you know, writing 10 blogs a day <laughs> and being harassed nonstop and, you know, getting laid off, like the, the toll that that takes on us as workers and that we, d we actually are workers and that we deserve, you know, rights and all of that other stuff. Um, I think that that's, you know, that's a conversation with all these new room newsrooms starting to unionize now that is starting to happen with my generation of journalists. And I'm really like proud of that. Um, but I think we have so far to go. Another big reason why I stopped writing and wanted to be more of an editor is I actually just like couldn't handle the harassment. There are a lot of journalists that have way better coping skills with it and it doesn't bother them as much. But for me, uh, it really, it really impacted me. And I was like, it's not worth it basically, which is sad. And I think we're, you know, I think that there are probably a lot of people who have left the industry because of that. Um, on the other hand, like, I think that that's a part of being a writer now and it, and you kind of, you know, have to be able to, to sort of find some balance within yourself of like not taking it too seriously. And some people are better at that than others. Um, and I would say like, what's super interesting about coming, I, I was always a feminist writer. So that's where, why I got a lot of the harassment. And when I came to Mel, which was sort of, you know, 
we're trying to, it's a, it's, it's a magazine from a male point of view, but also a more feminist point of view than probably a lot of other men's magazines. And I was able to, through my male writers, like for example, Miles Clee, I've assigned him tons of things that if I had written that, like they were my take and he agrees with them. But we always joke about how, like, if I had written them, the harassment I would have get and gotten, and then he writes it and it no, and everyone's just like, good piece. And he's constantly saying, like, he can't believe the difference um, for saying the same thing, like just having the male byline. I would say a perfect example is um, he did this great solicited dick pic experiment where, like, he had all these people, fans asking him for, like, dick pics online, you know, because he has an online presence. So he did this experiment where he was like, anyone who wants a dick pic uh, can get it if they request it. Granted, that is a very weird niche thing. Like not all male journalists are doing that. But like we were joking that if I had done that, it would have probably like ruined my career. Like there's no way that I could have done that. We only hear about unsolicited dick pics. And the idea that like people who have online profiles get asked for them is really interesting to me. So he did this sort of gonzo style piece called The Great Dick Pic Experiment. It was just him kind of writing about dick pics and them being solicited and what that means and blah, blah, blah. But like, if I had decided to do like the tit pic experiment and send pictures of my tits out, like, I feel like that would really impact my career negatively in a way that his was not. He got no harassment either. It wasn't like people like your dick is ugly. Uh, I bet that if I did it, it would have been like Reddit threads about my, my, you know, my boobs and what's wrong with them. Again, this is all conjecture, you know, we don't know, but it was interesting to see them like want to try to cancel him for it. Like they were offended, but then they were like, but they couldn't because literally everyone had asked and wanted to see it. Does that make sense? We think it's really weird that, you know, he had so many fan. I mean, he's a journalist and a writer. He's written like two fiction books. Why they want to see his dick so badly. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like as if it's like a celebrity's dick. Well, um, I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of editing like 4,000 words of a man writing about his own dick, but it's quite an experience and it went through a lot of drafts and I had to just like, you know, I think cutting through so that it's not just a piece about like people telling him how great his dick looks. <laughs> I love editing, you know, I sort of came up doing like personal essay stuff and reported memoir and so I really love the unique challenge of editing things from the first person that have like that are basically about the writer I would actually say that's sort of like my specialty as an editor and also as a writer um and it comes with its own set of challenges where it's like how much of this is projection and how much of this is universal and what perspectives aren't you considering and all of those questions are at play anytime you write any piece of journalism, but I think they're definitely heightened when the piece is about you, because it's even harder to see past your own blind spots. You know, I was thinking recently with all of these layoffs, we're seeing so many journalists um, start their own newsletters and Patreons and seeing them basically take ownership over their own brands and their own careers, which is like, I think amazing and honestly the safest bet right now. Someone recently asked me like, what would you do if you were trying to place a column? And I was like, just publish it yourself. Um, but on the other hand, I wonder about editing and I wonder how that fits in. So many editors have like saved my ass um, and vice versa. And like, I just know how important the process is specifically to like reported stuff um, that I wonder how that'll end up working. Again, I feel like people say writing is a disappearing sort of job, but so is editing, maybe even more so. I would say that what's more common, especially with a lot of writers who came up on the internet is like not expecting any editing at all and like being actively annoyed when there are edits and not feeling that the job is done when they turn it in. Um, which is always really interesting to me because I very much always saw editing as like a foundational part of the writing process. It's not like, like there is no, you know what I'm saying? If it's writing without editing, it's a journal entry. <laughs> It's a very editing forward magazine in the sense that like a lot of the editors are really shaping the ideas and we're definitely getting in there and getting dirty. Um, that's just sort of the editor philosophy that we have there. And I think you can tell by reading the magazine and it is a magazine. I mean, magazines at least historically are known for that. And that's why, 
you know, being a magazine editor was a prestigious thing because it, you really were shaping what you thought people should think. You know, it's like people go to news to know what's happening. People go to magazines to know how to feel about it. Um, and so, you know, I think I just kind of try to gently explain that like an editing is a big part of our process. And that's, that's literally how we ensure the magazine is as good as it is. It's not personal. It's not, um, because the piece is bad, literally everyone goes through the same process. And like, there's not really stuff up on the site that at least two editors haven't read, which is like pretty rare. Um, I've worked at websites where, you know, the editor is just proofreading it and, um, the writers are bringing all the ideas and that, you know, they both have values that works better in a news context. But I think, I think that, I think that understanding as a writer that the editor is only trying to make you better, um, is really key. And I think part of it is if you don't respect the editor, or believe that, then you see their edits as like hostile to you, but really all they're trying to do is make you look good. So I think that's like a key in the understanding of what editing is. People think it's copy editing, like that it's fixing typos. That's not, I mean, that is one kind of editing. A lot of the editing I do is really ideas based or narrative based. I'm like, or rhythm. Like you need another joke here. This doesn't land. You start a narrative here and then you drop it off and you don't pick it up again. This idea doesn't really track. These two things you're saying don't make sense together. Like that kind of editing, which is more about thinking than it is about words. And I think that's a really important distinction too. Like I see my job as an editor to make the thinking of the piece sharper first and foremost sometimes you turn something in and it doesn't need a lot of editing, but honestly, like editing is the safety net for the writer on their worst day. And even the best writer or the best thinker is going to have a bad day. And that's when the editor steps in and is like, I don't think you want to say it that way, or you shouldn't publish this at all. Yeah. Like a big job of an editor is just saying no to putting things on the internet. Like you don't even really know that they ever did that job, but they're, they're doing that a lot. I, I like to use the metaphor of a dentist, which is Dentists are people who are paid to find problems with your teeth and editors are also people who are paid to find problems. Like that's literally what we do. That's why it's a very specific personality. I think I'm good at it because I'm like hypercritical, always have been of myself, of other people. That's just like, I can find a problem in anything. So you also have to have that perspective, not saying that we're making problems up, but like a dentist is probably going to tell you that you need to be better at flossing. Like even if you're pretty good at it, you know, um, that's the, that's the job. The same way writers write, editors edit. It's not a great day to get a perfect piece. And most pieces aren't perfect. The editors write the headlines. And a lot of times they're, they're not the favorite of the writer. Um, but it's like, we're trying to get the most people, I mean, with respect, we, I don't want to do clickbait, but we're optimizing this headline to get the most people to read your work. So it's in everyone's best interest for this headline to be great in a certain way. So I'm always like, uh, the, I totally get it if you don't like the headline, but like 100,000 more people are going to read your piece because it's phrased this way as opposed to that way. So let's just keep our eye on the prize. I've been writing headlines my entire career. And when it comes to writing one for my own story, they're so bad. I just cannot see outside of the story. Um, or I become obsessed with one part of it that I think is the best part that's not actually the most attractive to readers. So it's really useful to have someone who hasn't been living the story. Um, a lot of times, you know, Cooper Fleischman, who works on the headlines at Mel, he's amazing. And he, he, we, he really workshops the headlines a lot on pieces he hasn't worked on. Like he'll skim them or read them and then we'll work together. Cause even as an editor, sometimes you're, you're too deep in it. So I'm always open to um, receiving pitches, especially for any like really big investigations or tips you might have. That's sort of, um, you know, a specialty of mine is that I work on work on the bigger features at Mel. Um, and I'm always looking for, you know, stuff that maybe our staffers haven't haven't seen, um, you know. And just general pitches, but I will say that, you know, I've been commissioning less and less of those, just what I call off the transom. Uh, there are sort of, you know, three tips I have in general that I've just seen over and over again. And I know that this first one, everyone would tell me this when I was in J school and I would be like, no, come on. But it really amazes me. Like, just make sure that we haven't covered it before. Um, 
Mel, for example, does a lot of stuff on, on, uh, physical health of men on dicks and penises. And people are always thinking they're like, it's really hard to find a new angle of something about penises we haven't covered. So I get pitched it nonstop and I'm just like, thank you so much. We covered that in 2017. Um, and so I just think taking that extra time to Google just, just kind of tells the editor you respect their time. Um, and also just saves you a lot of trouble. Like definitely Google to see if they've covered it before you even work on the pitch. The second thing is that a lot of the pitches, I understand they're more like form letters um, that probably are going to be sent out to a bunch of different people. But it's really important that you show in the pitch that you understand the publication you're pitching and you understand what the Mel angle is specifically to the story. Like, why are you pitching this to me? And why do you think this is good for Mel? Um, I would say that that's lacking in like most pitches. And that's really, I mean, that's the main thing. If you can convince me, because the thing is, I'm not just looking, is this a good story? I'm looking for, is this a good story for Mel? And, and making that clear to me and also that you read the site is great. Um, the last one I do, you know, it happens not as often, but I am kind of shocked how frequently it happens that um, someone who's pitching me sort of tries to argue with me. Like I'll say that like, no, we've kind of covered it or I'm not interested for X and Y reason. And then they really push back and try to convince me. I've never had that be successful. Like I've never been like, yeah, I'm changing my mind. Um, and like, I just, you know, I don't know. I, it's been a lot of, I think that's more of a trend with, with male freelancers. You know, I had one argue with me over how long a typical male article is. And I was like, I've been working here for three years and edit the site. Like we're, we're not going to, you're telling me that the word count is different than what the word, you know? It's so it's just, I was always like, at the end of the day, you're trying to show a level of professionalism and, um, picking fights with editors right away or telling them that like, cause for example, if you just are like, if you say no to a pitch for whatever reason, they're like, well, I disagree with you. And it's like, I don't know where we go from there, you know? Um, and you're not really, you're not really broadcasting yourself as someone that's easy to work with. Isn't that crazy? I know. I know that that seems, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, it seems nuts. Cause I was a freelancer and I would just be like, thanks for your time. The same way that becoming a writer now has become such a difficult job. Budgets are being slashed. There's no security. I mean, the same thing is happening for editors too. And they're doing the job of 10 editors their inboxes are insane. They don't really specifically have the time to argue with you over why a certain piece isn't going to work. Um, and I think, yeah, it's totally fine to respectfully ask like why someone is passing. I try to include why I'm passing on a piece every time I respond. But, um, you know, very rarely have I been like, like beaten into submission over a pitch that I don't think is right for the site. So thanks to Alana Levinson, Deputy Editor of Mail Magazine, for joining me on this episode. You can find her social media handles in the show notes and follow her. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do rate, review, subscribe, tell a friend, shout it from a hilltop while socially distancing responsibly, and uh, attach a copy of the show notes to a trained pigeon, not just any pigeon, and just send it out into the world because the more people that hear about the show and listen to it, the easier it makes it for me to uh, continue producing it. So uh, thanks for listening and uh, speak again soon. Bye.